Sure, okay. not a problem. So we're, um, we're live and in living color now. Okay, and as we're starting the recording, I'll mention uh, again, I mentioned it for some of the earlier folks that uh, a number of folks had contacted me about this saying that um, from their individual departments or ministries that either Zoom was blocked or they wouldn't be able to access this and they asked if there was going to be a recording. So what we're going to do is we're going to record it. When we upload it, we're going to set it to private and send it out to individual email addresses. So that way it's not going to be publicly available on the uh, on our YouTube channel or on the uh, Candy Learn website. But those folks that have contributed to this part of the report um, will have access to it. And essentially the folks that were invited here today um, were all of the, the ministries and departments across the country that had uh, helped compile the data as well as um, we have a five, sorry, six member advisory committee for the state of the nation, which comprises of uh, one representative from each of the sponsors, as well as a, a representative from the Canny Learn board. And then the Canny Learn board was also invited. So um, just to give you a sense as to who the audience will be for the recording um, for when we get to the discussion part. So I don't know if you want to add anything, Randy, or? Um, just a little bit about Zoom in terms of navigating. If you haven't done so already, uh, in your Zoom window, if you, if you mouse over, you'll see that you'll, it says you're viewing Michael Barber's screen. You have view options, so you can certainly go to original size, uh, or escape from full screen mode. If you do that, then you'll also see the gallery of, of videos across and you can move that around. It'll show four when there's screen sharing at the top, um, possibly more if you expand your window in the larger space. I don't know, I haven't tested that. But uh, <clears throat> at the same time, then that gives you the opportunity. We're, it defaults into the presenter mode. When we get into discussion, we're not looking at a particular screen and Michael's not sharing. Uh, I would encourage you to look at gallery view, and that way we all see each other for that level of discussion. Um, other than that, there's the text chat, which we'll make some comments in. Uh, Steve, if you're on mobile, you'll just see that pop by in front of your screen. You'll have to actually move to the text chat window away from the, what you're seeing in order to do that on mobile. But others, if you want to, you can take your text chat and uh, move that out as a separate window and rearrange that uh, as part of on your desktop as well if you choose to. So, any questions about Zoom? All right, so we're good to go. Yep. Um, so, looking across the top, it's probably quicker this way. We've got uh, Sarah Hainsworth from uh, the Department in Nova Scotia. Uh, we've got Margo, and I'm gonna mispronounce your surname, Margo, so I'm not gonna attempt it. Um, from the e-learning Ontario crowd, and I just noticed she's unmuted herself. So if she wants to give me her proper pronunciation, <laughs> it's Palmeter. Palmeter. Okay, yep. so I would have put in something else in the between the L and the M, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, then we've got Paul Lassance, who is one of our Candy Learn board members, and then we've got Steve Baker, who is one of our advisory board members and one of the sponsors of the report uh, from Virtual Learning, uh, Virtual High School Ontario. Sorry. Paul, you wanted to say hello? Yes. Hi, to, hi everyone, Paul Lachance, I'm with uh, the Cavell Faux, it's the consortium uh, uh, created by the 12 French language school boards in Ontario to offer e-learning to their students. All right, so um, basically uh, I'm just going to give sort of a high level perspective of, of what we've got in the report this year, focusing mainly upon things that are either um, have changed or are new to us and um, the new to us part there's a few things in there around that largely in part because we use an expanded survey this year but as I'm at the top I will we had a lot of in-kind contributions to different parts of the projects throughout the year and uh, one of which is you'll see the 10th anniversary logo that we've got there which uh, uh, Sarah's team actually the learning team in um, Nova Scotia were kind enough to put together for us so uh, that's uh, but Obviously, we're going to need another logo uh, next year because it won't be the 10th anniversary next year. So uh, that'll be something else we'll go looking for. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, at least one of our sponsors on, uh, well, two, I guess, if you count the, the folks from Can e Learn. Um, this has been done over the last three years, as a four now, Randy, as a partnership with Can e Learn. Um, and then over the last three years, the Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Center have been the ones that have published the report. And then um, the four groups you see there at the bottom, Virtual High School, um, CFED, LEARN, and the ADLC, 
have all provided um, either financial or in-kind sponsorships that allow us to do a lot of the research and allow us to go out and publicize the report uh, from year to year. Uh, and um, oftentimes, actually, because we're able to get out and publicize the, the report, that helps us actually create the report um, due to the fact that uh, we're making a lot of new contacts out there. So uh, I should open my chat window. And um, so just to give you a sense, and I think most of you are familiar with the reports, so you get a sense of the methodology, but um, this is the 10th year. Uh, we rely primarily in most cases upon things we get from the ministry that we supplement uh, with information that we get from key stakeholders, any documents that are available uh, to us. Um, what we try to do here is try to um, indicate where the majority of the information for an individual profile came from. Uh, so it's not that, as an example, if you look at Nova Scotia, Sarah, you see MOE. It's not that everything we have in the, the thing came from you guys, uh, but the majority of stuff that's in there came from you guys. Whereas uh, uh, Margo's used Ontario as an example, you'll see there's three lots there. And part of that is because, um, you know, the only contacts we have in the ministry are with e in Ontario, but then you've got, you know, the ILC, which operates independently in the privates, which, you know, are doing a lot of their own things. So we have to supplement a lot of that material um, with those kinds of things. So um, one of the interesting things that, uh, you know, throughout the years we've had all of the ministries participate at one point in time or another. Um, that's going to change a little bit uh, when it comes to Newfoundland going forward uh, because they've had a structural change there and the ministry is no longer involved uh, with their program. Um, so the only one that could have participated this year that didn't, unfortunately, was Quebec. We had to rely primarily on key stakeholders there. Um, the other thing that generates a lot of our data is the individual program survey. And for those, uh, and you know, I'm thinking Sarah, Margo, and Paul in particular, because you are interacting with a number of different programs on a regular basis, uh, encouraging folks to complete that, that program survey is, is something that's always useful to us. Uh, you can see sort of our, this is a, a real time, I checked this morning to make sure we had all of the, the ones that are in there, and you can see, um, and this is different than the ministry survey, and one of the things we find is those ministry-run programs often don't complete the individual program survey uh, because they provide some of the data that we're looking for in, the, uh, in, in their ministry response. But in the individual program survey, we, often, we do ask other additional questions that aren't included in the ministry one. Uh, things like number of courses, number of teachers, a little bit about the nature of the program. Um, you know, so those are things that um, you know, we... Um, uh, try to collect in there and those are all posted on the the website so you can actually go in and take a look at the most recent uh, responses from all of the programs that we've got so when you go into data and information uh, on the website and click on the uh, individual province or territory uh, you'll see the most recent ones so while as an example there are only right now nine that have um, responded from Alberta. I think there's about 16 or 17 that are listed there because we include everyone's most recent response. So if you responded say three years ago and that was your most recent response, you're still listed in the table uh, and we just update uh, as we get them. So um, I'm gonna give some sort of brief high level kinds of things because a lot of this hasn't changed and, and obviously the report will be coming out uh, it's being submitted to the publisher uh, by the end of the day today, which means it'll probably be coming out uh, the first week of January, I'm hoping, maybe the second week. Um, and you'll be able to pick it all up in there. And we're hoping to update the website over the holidays as well. So the individual provincial and territorial profiles will likely be updated before the actual report comes out. And we'll notify all of the ministries when that takes place. Um, but this is sort of, when you look at regulation across the country, this is, um, you know, how it sort of shakes down. And um, you see some trends here. Most jurisdictions have some reference to distance education in their legislation. Although, in all honesty, there's really only two that actually um, have any sort of real details to it. 
Uh, one would be Nova Scotia because the collective agreement that they make with the, the Nova Scotia's teachers union is, uh, you know, has to be passed by the legislature. Uh, the other is BC with the, the two sections, one in the Independent Schools Act and one in the Schools Act that go through and outline a lot of the um, things that distance distributed learning programs in BC have to follow. The other jurisdictions that are listed there, it's mainly just some sort of reference that says, um, you know, the minister shall have the authority to, and, you know, finish that sentence with something related to distance ed in there. And um, so when you look at sort of the substance of uh, most jurisdictions, it's these policy handbooks is where most of the substance for how things operate uh, is actually where you find it all. And we use the term handbook kind of loosely. Um, some jurisdictions will call it a framework. Um, you know, so I, you know, Margo using Ontario as an example. Um, I don't believe there's a, a static handbook, but you know, there is the e-learning Ontario framework that sort of guides everything. So uh, again, the, the use of the term handbook is, is being used very loosely in that. Um, and some of those supplement them with uh, agreements. So in the case of Ontario, there's the master user agreement. Um, in the case of BC, there's a, a distributed learning agreement that goes in conjunction with the legislation. And obviously you see with the three territories there, they primarily use memorandums of understanding with their Southern um, counterparts. And I suspect PEI has the same thing with New Brunswick, although we've yet to confirm that. I, mean, I don't know if it's an official memorandum of understanding or it's just sort of a, they've been doing it for so long that that's just how they do it now. Um, this is a chart you're probably all familiar with. It actually, I went back and started looking through old reports and it hasn't changed in the last six years. Um, and the last change that was made actually was turning PEI from red to green um, because essentially um, they got rid of their distant, their video conferencing program for some of their francophone offerings that year. Um, so this is one that, that you've all seen before if you've seen any of these presentations or, or looked at the reports. So, um, but it gives you sort of a, a sense as to um, the types of programs. And again, using the term district, um, that basically refers to school division, school board, school district. Um, we basically, the, the term district is actually uh, the one that tends to get used most in the literature because most of the literature is U.S. based and most U.S. jurisdictions only have school districts. But essentially we're looking at sort of the geographic regional um, authority, whatever that happens to be called. And one of the things we've tried to do this year in particular is to really focus upon the um, looking specifically in each of the individual profiles at using the language from that province. So looking at the level of e-learning activity this year, and e-learning referring to all forms of distance online and blended learning. Uh, so you'll see the numbers tend to be much higher than previous years, because this is the first time we've actually looked at this. Um, this is sort of where we shake down. And you'll notice there's a lot of tildes there because we're looking at, in a lot of cases, a lot of estimations or making a lot of assumptions uh, about things. And particularly when we get to the blended learning one, uh, I can tell you a little bit more about that. The one that you're likely more familiar with is this K-12 distance and online learning activity, which is basically, uh, that's up until this year, the only real statistic that we put out there. And you can get a sense as to where most jurisdictions fall. And, and um, nationally, we're looking at 5.4%, which is a little bit of a drop from previous years. Um, historically, you'll see that both BC and Alberta tend to be above the um, national average. Historically, Ontario, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, and to a lesser extent, Quebec, tend to be close to the national average, and then everyone else tends to be a, a fair amount below the national average. And that's been consistent um, pretty much um, ever since we've started doing this study, or at least after the third year when we started to get some good um, data from that, you know, once we had sort of developed our contacts uh, throughout the country. Um, to give you a sense as to how that's looked on a year-to-year -year basis, um, you can see, and I mentioned it's a bit down this year, uh, actually numeric or percentage-wise, we're back down to 13, 14 levels, so you'll see essentially the last two years we've been dropping a little bit. Um, part of that, I would suggest, is we're actually getting better data. Uh, there are some jurisdictions that 
um, hadn't participated for a couple of years, and I think the numbers might not, the extrapolations we were making might not have been completely accurate. Uh, in some cases, the ministries themselves, as we've been doing this for a while, have just gotten better internal mechanisms for collecting data. Um, and then part of it, I think, is that you're seeing a, a shift a little bit, um, particularly in certain jurisdictions, away from online learning and moving towards blended learning environments. And I'd point to Alberta and BC as two jurisdictions where I think this is happening a little bit more than others. Um, speaking of blended learning, uh, when we look at our estimates for blended learning, and I say estimates very specifically because these are basically, um, are in many cases, um, in all honesty, our best guesses. And in most cases, these are, there is the potential for this number, or there is at least this number, um, or there could be um, this number. And, and as an example, if you look at Quebec, um, we know of two specific programs that provide blended learning in Quebec, and those two programs service approximately 5,300 people. So we know there's at least 5,300 students in Quebec that are learning in a blended environment. That's two programs over, you know, several hundred schools. Um, at the same token, you know, in the case of, of Nova Scotia, um, the uh, provincial system uh, with the, the Google Apps and the Moodle and the other things they've been putting in place mean that all students have the opportunity to and all students being approximately 54,000. So there's the potential for up to 54,000, um, or I think it's over certain grades. And, um, you know, but that's not guaranteeing that there's 54,000. Uh, similarly, you know, Margo and, 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 and the rest of the folks in Ontario have, you know, we've had this discussion as well. You know, there are, um, you know, roughly 540,000 enrollments in the provincial LMS. An enrollment in the provincial LMS doesn't necessarily mean that the students are learning in a blended fashion in their classroom. Uh, the number that's there is the 500 and roughly 540 minus the number of students that we know are learning online. But that's also making the assumption that the students that are learning online aren't learning in a blended fashion as well. Many of them might be. Um, so that number you know, could represent a high amount, it could represent a lower amount than the actual number that's uh, taking place. But based upon the metrics that we have, it's sort of the best guess that we, we have available to us at this point. Um, since we've started trying to track the numbers for blended learning, these are, are sort of what we're looking at now. And um, so you can get a sense as to, um, you know, the, the, the approximate numbers that, that we've been, um, playing with over the years and I'm looking actually at the Nova Scotia one for 15 16 and I think I might have hit copy and paste in the wrong column because I think you guys have been roughly 54 all the way across if I remember correctly um, so I'll have to make sure that that's not something I duplicated in the report uh, before I send it off but um, you can see here uh, and I'll point out you know all of these asterisks is here on the bottom. Um, you know, many of these things are based upon estimates from the number of enrollments in the provincial learning management system. Some of it is data provided the ministry and that data oftentimes, if you look at the New Brunswick examples, you know, it's data provided by the ministry, but it's based upon enrollments in the provincial LMS that aren't distance ed enrollments. Um, you know, there's a lot there that we just aren't able to figure out. And then sometimes it's based on the responses we're getting from our individual program survey. So just quickly to go across the, the country, and I won't spend much time in each of the provinces because I do want to get to um, you know, a chance for you guys to sort of ask questions about new things we've found. So I'll just focus upon things that have changed. And I won't really focus upon the um, programs and activity there. I just put it there so you can see it as we go across. Um, in the case of Newfoundland, the, the main change was uh, the single uh, distance ed program, the CDLI that's there, used to be a direct, um, directly embedded into the Ministry of Education. As part of uh, the budget in 2017 in April, it was moved to the English language school district that's in the province, uh, much to the surprise of most of the people involved, including the English language school district, it seems. 
Um, so that was, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a big change uh, going forward. It hasn't been a change that much last year or this year because the school district is still trying to figure out exactly what this entity is, how it operates and, and that kind of thing. Um, but come the 12th edition of the report, so when we put out the 20, I guess 19 report, I suspect we'll start to see some changes there. Um, the only change in, in Nova Scotia was uh, over the past year, they've uh, renewed um, the uh, collective agreement that they have with the uh, NSTU and all of the distance learning provisions that were in there uh, remained and as best I can tell, haven't changed any uh, as I look through them. So uh, that's really the only thing there. And it's not really a change other than to say that it's a continuation. Um, in PEI, there's no change from what we've had in, in, in previous years uh, based upon what's been written in the report. Uh, similarly, there's also no change in New Brunswick when you look at uh, the, the way in which they go through. Um, Quebec, there's also no change, but Quebec is one of those jurisdictions that um, isn't involved in distance education at the provincial level. And um, now the... Uh, Oh, sorry, I'm just looking at the, the note Sarah put in uh, the chat box there about uh, some of the changes in the collective agreement. And um, so, but in the case of Quebec, because they've devolved everything directly to the school districts, uh, they don't have anything in terms of regulation that could change. Um, as best I can tell, there was no changes in Ontario other than the fee seems to go up about six or eight or ten dollars every year, which I'm guessing is just an inflationary thing. Um, the same thing with uh, Manitoba, there's no shift in the regulatory thing, but um, they've been piloting these two virtual collegiates over the last couple of years. Um, so I suspect that over the next little while, instead of having the correspondence, the instructional television, and then the web-based options that are being run directly by the ministries, or supported directly by the ministries, we may see some policy shifts starting to happen to allow these virtual collegiates to go beyond just the pilot phase that uh, they're currently in. Um, similarly with Saskatchewan, as of right now, there is no change, although uh, I see change coming down the pipe, um, or at least clarification coming down the pipe, largely because um, Joanne Saunders out there has been actively working with the stakeholders throughout the province to try to get um, clear definitions of how things are actually operating so they can get a better sense as to how to regulate and support um, distance learning out there a bit. Um, and I'd say the same thing about Alberta. It's not listed on the slide, but um, since Daylin has uh, joined in Alberta, you've seen the Alberta education reach out to the stakeholders a lot more, trying to get a sense as to what's happening so that they can provide better support. And the online learning toolkits that um, they actually, this past fall, uh, so not part of last year's school year, so not in this year's report, but um, in the fall, they actually released the first of those guides that are going to form that toolkit, and I believe they're planning on releasing the second one before the end of the year. Um, some of the things that we've learned because we've asked a few more questions about uh, distance education um, in the annual survey, um, there is a specific code for distance education in Alberta. So in theory, if the schools and school authorities actually coded it correctly, uh, the government would have a much better opportunity to get a sense as to the, not, the actual numbers that are happening there. Um, as it stands now, their numbers tend to be underreported because a lot of schools don't. Part of that may be, and, and I say may, um, because when a student is coded as a distance student, um, they have about uh, a number of different funding envelopes, they call them, that are attached to each student. And if a student is in the brick and mortar environment, they get all of those envelopes. If they're in the online environment, distance environment, they only get certain ones, things like, actually a lot of things dealing with facilities and the, you know, the actual brick and mortar kinds of things are the envelopes that they don't get. So I think some schools, uh, this is my assumption, um, don't code the students as distance to not lose that funding. Um, at least that's the sense I get from talking with stakeholders um, out there. 
Um, in BC, there's no change from previous years, but one of the things that is new um, in terms of reporting in um, the actual report is, um, and we've known this for a couple of years, but we haven't had the exact figures, but you can see that uh, funding for brick and mortar uh, students are different than funding for distributed learning students. Uh, distributed learning students are funded at a lower rate and uh, you can see sort of the full FTEs there as well as the per course uh, cost. And this might be one of the reasons why we're seeing a drop in the number of online students, distance students in British Columbia, uh, because I think a number of the programs are starting to shift more to uh, blended learning environments so that they can keep the extra last year, almost $1,200 if you look at the full FTE. Uh, but again, that's, uh, I think, speculation on our part based upon um, information we're getting from the stakeholders as opposed to sort of any official tracking that the, the ministry is doing there. Um, no change in um, the Yukon in terms of the regulation. Similarly with the Northwest Territories, although both of those um, jurisdictions have their own internal pilots now. Uh, so in both cases, you'll see the the... Uh, participation and distance you had a slash there the first number is the number of students that are being served by their internal pilot the second number is the number that they're getting from southern programs so in the case of the Yukon um, 91 students are being served by BC based programs so in the number in parentheses is the total number um, so you can see those numbers that are involved with the pilot are growing and the numbers that are being served by BC or Alberta are shrinking and as you can see here in the Northwest Territories this is actually the first year that they've served more of their own students than what they've needed to have others serve them um, so you're starting to see them building that internal capacity uh, which you haven't seen in previous years um, the case of Nunavut they're the only ones that don't have any internal capacity at all uh, so they're getting their programming primarily from either uh, the ADLC or Contact North um, although they say that in the next two years they should begin their first internal pilot uh, of a distance ed program. So moving down that same road that we've seen the Yukon and uh, the Northwest Territories go. Finally, we've got um, you know, our First Nations Métis and Inu uh, groups which fall under INAC. There's been a couple of, of or one change I should say, and then one um, discovery on our part when it comes to our federal colleagues. Uh, the first change is actually Indian Affair or Indian and Northern Affairs Canada um, is actually being divided into two separate departments now. Uh, one is called Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs, and then the other one is called Indigenous Services Canada. And all of the social programs for the most part, so housing, education, schooling, um, uh, health, they're all going to fall under that second one now, Indigenous Services Canada. Uh, so they'll fall under that, that second department there, uh, which will be sort of a new administrative structure for them. Uh, the other thing that we learned is uh, when you look at the First Nations nominal roles that they use for funding purposes, they actually have three codes that they use uh, for different types of distance and online learning, and then two codes that they have specifically for blended learning. Um, so they can actually give us an exact number um, for each of those five codes, and that's reported in the uh, report. And uh, so the totals are there at the bottom. Uh, the other thing that we noticed um, this year, that we learned this year, is while we've lost two um, First Nations Métis in programs over the last four years, there are actually two new ones that uh, have come on the, the landscape this year, um, both of which are, are based in Ontario. So those are ones that uh, we're hoping to reach out to uh, in the coming years so that we can find out more about them. Um, the actual study or the, re the report that's gonna come out, um, in addition to the provincial profile, the jurisdictional profiles, um, we're looking at one or two brief issue papers. We have one for sure. Uh, the second one, we're still, um, the author of the second one is still trying to get permission from their partner to be able to um, post it. I suspect if it doesn't make it into this year's report, it'll be placed in the 2018 report. Uh, we've got seven new vignettes, mostly coming from um, the northern jurisdictions or out west. Um, 
I don't think there's many from Central or Eastern Canada there. Um, one of the things that we're looking at, the while it's the 10th anniversary study, the study is going to be um, uh, much smaller, shorter than other ones. It's going to focus primarily upon the jurisdictional profiles. A lot of the other things that we would put in there in terms of discussing trends and and really trying to unpack things. We're actually going to try to use the website and the blogging function on the website uh, to do that as a way of pushing out more regular content. Uh, so as an example, one of the early posts that we're gonna put up is uh, we're going to look at uh, essentially all of the reports that have been done over the last uh, 10 to 20 years looking at K-12 distance education that are um, that have been you know published that a lot of people just don't know about um, so we're going to put links to those or citations for those as well as um, you know a couple of sentences that describe what they were about where they were done uh, and then the other thing that we're particularly proud about is we actually have a uh, at least a basic French language version of the website now uh, thanks to uh, in-kind contributions, largely from CFED, uh, we've been able to do that. And I'm going to come back to that in a sec because I actually have something that um, uh, a request that I'm going to make of, of all of our stakeholders across the country. Uh, so to finish up with a couple of general trends, um, you know, the use of e-learning continues to grow. Um, we're seeing some shift from distance to blended, particularly in certain jurisdictions, more so in some jurisdictions than others. Um, you know, there's, there's, we are getting much better data now than we would have 10 years ago, or for that matter, even five years ago. Uh, but there are still, and this tends to be more of a jurisdictional thing. Uh, there are some jurisdictions that do a great job at being able to provide um, figures and, and others that um, there's still some work to be done. And interestingly, we're seeing the ministry start to do uh, some of that work to try to, you know, fill that gap on their own. Um, and that's particularly true of blended learning, but in all honesty, I think that's to be expected of blended learning, particularly the way in which we view it. And um, one of the things that I, I thought was particularly interesting was um, when we look at where we see the highest proportion of students engaged in blended learning, they all tend to be in jurisdictions where uh, there's a provincial LMS, oftentimes there's provincial content available. Essentially, it's where the ministry or the department have made a, the environment that allows classroom teachers to be able to engage in this kind of thing. Um, and, um, you know, because of that, folks have been, felt supported when they've gone in there. It's not like they have to go and create things on their own and learn LMSs or, you know, Google tools or what have you on their own. They have all that available. So I mentioned um, the French language website. Uh, when I say we've got the basis of one, basically all of the main categories, we've got the information up. Where we're lacking is in the provincial profiles. Um, we've actually had a couple of groups that have provided in-kind um, translations of their profiles. So we've got, um, you know, Learn has gone through and, and translated the Quebec one. CFED is working its way through the, uh, the, the Alberta one. Uh, Manitoba, the department there, actually translated their um, profile for us. So one of the things that uh, over probably in early in January, that I'll be sending to all of the stakeholders, so all of the ministries, the Canny Learn Board, even our sponsors, um, is going to be a request for uh, folks to see if they would be willing to take on translating just their profile, so just the profile from their individual jurisdiction. Um, I'd like to start with the 2016 ones because we've already got some of those done and then move on to the 2017 ones. And then we're working with some other groups, uh, CFED and, and others, to actually try to seek funding to be able to go back and translate previous editions of the report. Uh, but since we've started now, we're hoping that essentially last year and this year, uh, we might get translated by um, folks across the, the community um, on an in-kind basis. So um, as Randy posted the, the link in there, but. Uh, all of this will be available likely before the print version is available up on our website, which is k12son.ca, or State of the Nation. And um, 
we've got about 20 minutes or so. I told Randy I'd aim for 30. I was actually 34 minutes, Randy. Uh, but we've got about 20 minutes because um, I wasn't sure how many people were going to be here and, and how many questions or what kind of discussion folks would have. Um, but I wanted to open it up to folks, and I think Randy's going to try to moderate this a bit. Sure. I, I'm, I'm curious about your commentary around the blended learning that's now part of the report. How does that match to your thoughts, your perceptions, your understandings of what might be going on in your own jurisdiction? Do you want to put that blended learning slide back up? Yes. Yeah. Let me go back and get it here. What I found interesting um, in reading through was the whole e-learning activity. So my perception was sort of like BC and Alberta had a lot of activity. <clears throat> and when I looked at the total e-learning activity, it seemed to be higher in Ontario and in Nova Scotia. And I'm going, hmm. That doesn't jive with my anecdotal assumptions or characterizations. And I was trying to figure out why. And then when you look at the blended learning, it's based on these, these numbers are based on um, registrations in a central system. So is there more blended learning going on in Ontario or is it just because there's a central system that they can register in? And yeah. it, it, so go ahead, Margo. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But you're uh, completely right on the blended learning. Um, all that we're reporting right now is our estimates using our provincial uh, virtual learning environment. We know that there's lots of blended learning going on out there using Google tools, using different platforms, and, and using other digital resources. But those numbers we, we don't have right now. So we suspect that this number is, is actually much higher. Right, and, and if you think of it in terms of blended learning practice, um, I mean, I'm, I'm working with groups of teachers and they're blending their practices um, in Weebly. They're, they're putting sites together for students to interact on. Um, they're expecting them to do that. They're following BYOD uh, approaches and all sorts of things. So it's really hard to get a metric on that, right? That's right. Yeah, for sure. Sarah's kind of nod her head, so is Paul. Yeah, I would agree. In Nova Scotia, um, so we have a Moodle environment, and so part of our numbers are based on the number of kids who are in Moodle, and you would only go, you would only create a Moodle account if you were using it. So the assumption is that if there are 54,000 accounts, then 54,000 of those users have been on in some capacity doing something on Moodle. We also have a Google a G Suite um, instance that's provincial, and so kids create accounts in that system. So we, the assumption is that if they've created an account, they're doing something in Google. So our numbers are high but we don't track the level of activity. We only track the number of um, accounts. Yeah. Accounts, yeah. 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 I think, Randy, one of the other issues maybe, and we didn't state it specifically in this year's report, so um, it's not in front and center in your mind, but in previous reports, uh, at least three years ago anyway, um, I made the argument that across Canada, we tend to think, of blended learning more on a continuum of technology integration as opposed mm -hmm. to what we see in the US. And it's starting to creep more and more into Canada now, but this idea of there's classroom learning, there's online learning, and then there's blended learning, and it's something that's different than classroom learning. Uh, whereas I think across Canada, we've always sort of seen it as, like I say, on that continuum thing, which is I, another one of the reasons why I think it's that much harder to track in terms of actual data. In, uh, and in Ontario, uh, and I'll be talking only with the, in regards to the French language school boards in, the system, in, our, uh, in our system, but uh, uh, under, our, under the provincial agreement that we have uh, with the 12 French language school boards with uh, the ministry, 
there is a definition of what is uh, blended learning and what is online learning. So uh, uh, if we want to get some clear clear statistics uh, by that, we we can give we, we can certainly uh, give you a lot of clear uh, solid statistics on what's going on in French language schools when it comes to online learning. But then when it comes to blended learning, then again, you might read, we might, someone might read the definition that the ministry has, but then when you come into the school and the school boards, that can, blended learning can mean a lot of things. And as, um, as others have mentioned, uh, we do have our provincial LMS and we can get some statistics out of that LMS of uh, number of uh, uh, teachers and students uh, in an, working in a blended environment and uh, but uh, there are a lot of other there's a larger definition of what is blended learning when we think that uh, school boards would be using also uh, G, uh, Google suite uh, Google application for education in a blended environment uh, and or Microsoft tools or whatnot so it, it's um, it's a bit difficult to get uh, clear statistics when definitions tend to change from one district to the next or from one school to the next. Excellent. Yeah. So I, I think this is the reason why I wanted to, to chat a little bit about this is because it's, it's such an important yet emerging practice that is, is really permeating uh, across curriculums, but uh, within school districts, schools, but also within ministry uh, directions in terms of what's happening across here. And, and how to quantify it might be problematic in, as Michael, you, you'd indicated that classroom teachers that start to put some practices online, is that really blended learning in a strict definition? In the U.S., um, the research that Horton Staker had done uh, and, and Clayton Christensen Institute have really quantified them into models, and you fit into a block rotation, into you know, you know that flex model, or and they've, they've they've really quantified them into those pieces. And then if you are offering that model, it's possible to actually go and ask a school, "Are you offering a you know blended learning model of which one you are?" Um, but I use the term practice and blended learning practice because to me it's more about using online spaces to engage in learning opportunities with students and how and when that happens. Does that mean that students are only attending for three days a week? Um, in many cases that tends to be a factor about determining if it really is truly a blended approach, that students aren't required in attendance at the school in a classroom for that period. Uh, the question came up uh, in a meeting this morning with those that are planning the BC Symposium. And um, the, the response was that, no, we require students to go to a learning commons room in our secondary school if they're actually doing online learning, working in online learning spaces. So is that more a measure about how we determine if that's a blended learning program? I, uh, this, I'm curious, sorry if I'm stealing your discussion time, Michael, but it's it's one that's I'm puzzling over quite a bit. No, I'm I was open to however folks wanted to take this. Any thoughts on that? Okay, I, I don't want to push it up the hill. I'll, I'll, I'll come back at you probably independently in different ways on that particular notion. Um, it's my, it's my bee and it's in my bonnet. It's going to be there for a couple of years at least. Um, are there other questions? Paul, go ahead. Well, no, if I go back to, to, to the, to the previous discussions that you, that you were mentioning, uh, what I find, um, difficult to, uh, to fathom is that we, um, uh, the data about the blended learning activity and all of that. Uh, there, there are a lot of asterisks. There are a lot of estimates. Um, is, is there a way that through time we can fine tune 
the surveys in such a way that we might get um, uh, more precise data on the levels of activity in, in blended online distance learning across the country. Because my first reaction when I see these various slides is, okay, what can I do with this data basically? It's somewhat limited. And that's just a reaction I have. Uh, and I'm, I'm new at this game, so, uh, um, and, and I'm new around this table, so uh, I'm, just, I'm just saying what's coming through my mind when I look at the data that was presented. No, it's, it's a useful question. Um, in terms of how you can use this data, I think using it to look from province to province, I don't think is useful. Um, because, you know, what, the, even if I look back at, say, you know, the, the previous slide here, where I can, you know, I have the percentages here, even something like that is, is not useful because how, you know, Ontario calculates it is different than how Nova Scotia calculates it is different than how New Brunswick calculates it is different than how we were able to uh, estimate a number for Quebec. Um, but when you look at this table, I think going across is, is probably the only useful way that I think this data can be used where you can look at it and say, um, you know, you get a sense as to at least based upon the data that we can collect. Because in most cases, the data from year to year in an individual province usually is coming from roughly the same source. Um, and in that case, you can get a sense as to um, you know, is it in that province based upon that specific data source? Is the information, you know, changing and which, you know, how is it changing? Um, you know, so as you look, um, you know, I'll use New Brunswick as an example because they report to the number of students that are enrolled in the LMS and they give a very precise number with that. Um, you know, you can see they experienced this, you know, a, a drop of about a thousand folks uh, from, you know, the, the first year we tracked to the second year. Uh, they've had added another 1,800 folks from last year to this year in that system. Um, you know, in the case of Ontario, the first thing you notice is these two numbers are the same, and that's because I didn't have a number from last year. So it's, but if you look at over the last two years period, so from 2014-15 up to 2016-17, the number of unique enrollments in the LMS has, um, doubled and if you factor in the distance ed students there it's more than doubled um, now what does that tell you about activity we don't know but at least we can say that more students are in the system and have the ability to potentially do this almost twice as many students um, is that does that mean there's twice as much blended learning going on maybe maybe not but at least we see a specific sort of trend that we can point to. And, and in the case of Ontario, I think a very significant upward trend. Um, in terms of the, the data, um, you know, and, and our ability to collect it in the future, um, I think one of the diff biggest difficulties that we have is that um, I can't foresee a specific way in which ministries will ever be able to track this other than to create some kind of code in their, you know, in their student information system that says blended learning and relying upon schools and school authorities to code the student that way. Um, but as we've seen in the case of you know, the online learning students in Alberta, that relies upon schools and school authorities of coding them correctly, and they don't always do that. Um, you know, the only other say, way we could do it is if we had some sort of um, reasonable response rate, not just from the online programs, you know, because when I go back and as an example, I look at, you know, these were, these are mainly online programs here. Um, over the last three or four years, we've been able to add in some blended programs as we've been able to identify them or specific school districts we know that are doing blended learning, but that might only make up maybe I'm going to guess between 20 to 40 of the 285 people were asking, you know, what are you doing when it comes to online and blended learning? Um, you know, there are, what is it, 75 school districts in Ontario, as an example. Um, there's another 40 or so in Manitoba. There's another 
30 in, um, you know, Prince Edward or in uh, Saskatchewan, just those three provinces alone, there's, there's what, is there 80 something in, in BC, Randy? Those four provinces alone, just if we were asked the school districts would equal up more than 285 folks. So, you know, unless we were had the ability to survey each of the schools and got, you know, a 60 or 70% response rate there where we could, you know, extrapolate the 30 or 40% that we were missing. Um, you know, that would be a, um, um, you know, we might be able to do it there, but I don't think that's going to be the case. Our best bet would be if the ministries had a something in their um, student information system that was called blended learning that schools could use and that, you know, they encouraged schools to use it. But even then, I don't think we'd get an accurate number. Yeah, it depends on how they count, et cetera. But it's, it's curious, Paula, one of the questions that you, you had in terms of the definition, I know that that's something that uh, Daylene Lowen in Alberta, Ed, is pursuing to try to uh, build a consistent you know, definition and understanding of what blended learning is for that particular province in their practices. Saskatchewan is going down that same road as well. Right. Sorry, thanks. And and I just want to add on is is uh, yeah I was going to say that about about the definition uh, until we have a definition and, and as you pointed out in Ontario we have the sixty English language school boards plus twelve French language school boards um, so it's it's very difficult to get you know the responses and and the data roll up uh, but the um, the whole key I think is is that coding so in Ontario they're reporting to ONSIS. Um, e-learning credits versus uh, non-e-learning credits. Again, it's in the coding, whether they're actually reporting that. And in our virtual learning environment, we actually encourage uh, our school boards to code blended learning courses versus e-learning courses. Is this consistently done? No, it's not right now, but we hope that it'll be, it, it'll be, uh, you know, we'll have a better practice moving forward so our data will be, you know, reflect really what's going on. Yeah, I think this is just going to be a, a it'll get better over time kind of situation. Although I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we can have the the same kind of precision that we do with with online or, or, or distance. Um, but having said that, I mean some jurisdictions, uh, you know, Saskatchewan and Alberta are two as good examples. We don't have a lot of precision with even the online and and, and distance uh, part levels of participation there. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, we have some work to do on the data. I, I don't deny that. And, uh, but I also don't necessarily think that's a bad thing either. As, as Randy mentioned, um, you know, I, I think, you know, being able to show places where it's being done and being able to show different models, you know, being able to say something like, um, jurisdictions that have a centralized LMS that provide content to the teachers and in the case of Ontario because they're the only ones that do it actually have support personnel at the the school board office that is there to help teachers that want to do distance and online learning you know those kinds of things that's a model and we can describe that kind of thing in the report that you know it, it doesn't come through on a table like this but in the jurisdictional profile you get a sense as to you know, particularly this year, because we're actually, um, the report is going to change a little bit in terms of its, and, and the ministry folks have seen the draft of this, um, instead of just having K-12 e-learning activity and then governance and regulation, it'll start with governance and regulation, and then there's a section specifically upon um, online and blend, or sorry, online and distance activity, and then a third section on blended learning activity, where it gives us a chance to describe some of these uh, contexts, if you will, so that people can get a sense as to, you know, looking and seeing, you know, this province is doing a lot of it, and here's how it happens. Um, you know, in the case of Quebec, for that matter, you know, we don't know a lot of folks that are doing it, but of the folks that are doing it, this is how we believe it's happening, or this is how it is happening in those programs. So I'm noticing we're at the, the bottom of the hour, so unless anyone had a sort of a burning question that they wanted to end on. Um, 
basically, and I don't mind sticking around for a little bit to talk with folks if they do have specific questions afterwards, but I did want to be cognizant of your time. So um, if you do have things that you have to get to now, but you have questions, uh, feel free to email us and uh, thank you for showing up and it'll probably be early next week when we get around to sending out the slides and the recording so that we can go through and make sure we get um, everything coded correctly in YouTube so that it is truly a private video. Um, and um, I don't know if you have anything else, Randy. Yeah. Uh, just uh, do we have a timeline in terms of when the actual report will be published? Um, it goes to the publisher. Um, basically by the end of the day today. Um, I suspect it will, normally it takes three weeks, but we also have the holidays right in that. So I would say this year, it might be closer to four to five weeks, which would put it probably at the second week of um, January. Sometime in January in the new year. Okay. Yeah, but all of the profiles will be updated over the holidays on the website. So the website will be active. Uh, the actual publication will be out a little bit later. Because, yeah. of course, it's, it's faster to upload digital copy than it is to actually process it and print it. All right. So thank you, everyone. And uh, like I say, I can hang out here for if folks have questions. Otherwise, enjoy your weekends. Thanks, all. Have a great weekend.